Hello, uh, welcome and thank you all for joining this webinar. I am Suresh Subramani, the Global Director of the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society, also called TIGS or TIGS. We are delighted that you've uh, joined us for this inaugural lecture in a new series that's called Science Serving Society that is sponsored by TIGS. So the goals of this lecture series are threefold. First, we want to highlight national and indeed global problems in healthcare and food security. Second, we intend to focus our attention on current progress in these particular fields, namely what has been done, how well is it working, and what are the challenges that uh, confront us at this point in time. And finally, we'd like to offer new solutions, often made possible by new emerging technologies. And all of these goals, of course, will be discussed by a panel of experts that we hope to draw from an international panel. So the topic for today is the persistent dangers posed by mosquito-borne diseases. To put this in context, the mosquito has been dubbed by Bill Gates as the world's deadliest messenger because although the mosquito bite does not cause disease in itself, the mosquito transmits a variety of nasty human pathogens, particularly viruses and parasites, which collectively put 6.5 billion people on the planet at risk for many devastating diseases that you'll hear about in today's talk. Now, humanity has been plagued by mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases for over 60,000 years. And despite the national and global efforts, the holy grail of ridding the world of even one of these mos many mosquito-borne diseases, namely malaria, remains elusive at this point in time. Now, following the global successes in eradicating smallpox and polio, India and the WHO aspired to eliminate malaria by 2030 and 2050 uh, uh, in India and, and the rest of the world, respectively. But this remains a stretch goal because uh, this is particularly challenging for reasons that you will hear about. And at the present time, the success in this venture is threatened because the world's healthcare and financial resources are being sequestered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now to highlight the problem, the progress, and the new solutions regarding today's topic, the persistent dangers posed by mosquito-borne diseases, we have assembled an exciting international panel of experts, each of whom will talk for about 10 minutes to present their perspectives. And then at the end of that, after 40 minutes, uh, I will engage the group in a panel discussion for 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, meantime, we encourage you, the audience, to send uh, through the chat panel, uh, the ch chat button, um, the questions that you might have for the panelists, and we would find a way to answer those offline uh, through emails and other communications with you uh, based on your registration materials. So the outstanding credentials of each of the experts is already available in the program, so I'm going to keep my introductions to them very brief. Uh, we'll kick, kick the program off with a talk initially by Dr. Brish Tyagi, who retired as the director of the ICMR Center for Research in uh, Medical Entomology in Madurai. And Dr. Tyagi will talk about the complexity of mosquito-borne diseases and why we have been unable to control them. So Dr. Tyagi, I'm going to hand this off to you. Thank you very much, Professor Subramani. Well, the topic uh, is the complexity of mosquito-borne diseases and why we have not been able to control them. The topic involves two important issues. One is the mosquito and another is the mosquito-borne diseases. I will quote Spielman and D. Antonio, who said, mosquito may be smaller, but this is a giant of a killer. There are a number of vector-borne diseases or mosquito-borne diseases worldwide. Eight of them are listed here. Two of them are of great interest to man because they bring about a lot of mortality and morbidity. The vector-borne diseases worldwide account for more than 17% of all the infectious diseases and bring about more than 700,000 deaths. Malaria itself causes 219 million cases with about 400,000 deaths. 
But dengue is of great importance because more than half of the population of the world is at the risk of dengue infection. The complexity of the transmission of diseases is because also the fact that many of the diseases are zoonotic involving vertebrate host. This kind of involvement of the host makes the life cycle of the disease pathogen very complicated. Take the example of malaria. Malaria is a disease which is rampant for centuries and had been bringing about great maladies. The vectors of the disease are spread all over the world in the tropical and subtropical countries. Many characters are adding up to its uh, uh, violence and of the nearly 70 malaria species worldwide, 41 are those which are main or are having species complexes to make the entire complexity more complicated. Many of the vector-borne diseases are of course having more than one vector and this makes the control of the disease really very, very difficult. Two of these diseases are of uh, uh, mention, uh, are requiring great mention over here. Uh, one is malaria, which the efforts have brought down enormously uh, in cases. And similarly, lymphatic fluorisis is now targeted to be completed, uh, to be, to be uh, controlled uh, in next uh, few years. However, there are certain issues which relate to the campaign of control uh, of these vector-borne diseases and one of them is the issue of the resistance development against the insecticide in vector which has made them greatly resistant to the control uh, uh, controlling insecticides and the mosquito has changed in its behavior a great deal. It has enhanced the geographical distribution, it has intensified the susceptibility to various pathogens, it has increased the breeding habitats, its density, its feeding range, and it has also shifted in its vector ecology and behavior. Take two examples of, uh, from India. One is the Thar Desert, where the malaria was very low in its intensity and uh, the epidemic used to occur uh, as an unstable uh, malaria. Nevertheless, in 1980s onwards, because of a major canal system drawn in the Thar Desert, the original vector, Anopheles istifensiae, which was breeding in a very local situation called Dhaka and Barry, had started breeding in the open spaces and a new vector was inveigled into the Thar Desert and species, which contributes more than 65% of malaria in the country. The second example is of dengue. In Kerala, which never witnessed the presence of dengue before mid-1990s, the entire Kerala state came under the uh, onslaught of dengue from 1996 and 97 onward because it is Agopictus had found a new breeding site, the rubber plantation in the state, which are grown over more than 50% of the mainland in Kerala. Now, resistance to drug poses one of the greatest threats to malaria control. It results in maladies and various kinds of disturbances including morbidity and mortality and the resistance currently has spread in three of the five malaria parasites plasmodium falciparum plasmodium vivex and plasmodium uh, malaria it is very important to find out ways to either reduce the resistance to the new antimalarials or we need to find out new antimalarials against which the parasites have not developed the resistance.
malaria vaccine is a great subject and man has achieved uh, this uh, feat uh, by uh, at least uh, developing the first malaria vaccine called RTSS or AS01 or Mosfi Riggs, which is now tested in three African countries and has been found quite effective in protecting more than 40% of the population vaccinated. Now, there are two different types of the vaccines group to be developed. One is the human vaccine, the other one is the mosquito vaccine. And there are three areas in the life cycle of the parasite where the vaccine have to be developed. The blood state vaccine, the pre erythrocytic vaccine, and the transmission blocking vaccine. We already have this RTSS as a pre erythrocytic vaccine, which is doing very well. And hopefully it will come into the uh, uh, commercial marketing in a couple of years. But the scientists are also working on the wonderful methodology of blocking the transmission so that the community can be saved. There are many fields which need uh, innovative researches. These are vaccines, antiparasitic drugs, and insecticides including repellents, ITBN or DefenderNet, which is made by the Indian uh, forces for their armies and the reduction of the vector habitats. Now we know that with the availability of the uh, new technologies, particularly Israeli insect technology or the same, is the WH is now testing in uh, some countries, including Bangladesh, and the genetically injured mosquito, which have done great job in many countries, including Cayman Island, Brazil, and now very recently, USA has given permit to use it in their country, and it has been found to reduce not only the mosquito population, it has also been found that it is affecting the intensity of the disease. And similarly, the new technology of Olbachia induced compatibility, uh, 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 cytoplasmic incompatibility, which later on Professor Liu will be speaking about. In summary, may I say that mosquito and mosquito borne diseases are really very complex subjects. More than 50% of the population in the world is infected by at least one mosquito borne or vector borne disease. They are unpredictable. Infections may always, many a times, relapse, even if the person is treated well. And the mosquitoes are deeply rooted in the environment where they prevail. That means they have a great adaptability prowess against the forces uh, meant to control them. Yet, we have the success stories as well. We have the success story of the control of yellow fever in Havana in Cuba, way back in the early 20th century. And from the Indian scenario, we have a wonderful time of control of malaria in early 1960s, when less than 0.1 million cases were reported without a death. Now, we are targeting control of malaria and lymphatic filariasis within a decade time before 2030 and the time will be there to celebrate once again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tyagi. Our next speaker is Dr. P.K. Srivastava. Um, uh, we welcome him and uh, he comes to us is the director of the Absolute Human Care Foundation and is the ex-director of the National Vector-Borne Disease Control Program of the Government of India. He will discuss the history of malaria control and eradication, particularly in the Indian context, and explain why new innovation is necessary to meet the national goals of ma malaria eradication by 2030. Dr. Srivastava, I hand this over to you. Good evening. And first of all, let me thank you, Tix. Uh, there is a small correction. Am I audible? Yes, I was I was joint director, not the director of National Vector Borne Disease Control Program, but it is a good compliment. <laughs> I am I am thankful for that. So I was telling that the topic was little larger because there are three basic component 
that history of global malaria then with indian scenario and what we have worked so far and whether the new invention are necessary actually i was just watching some questions and there are some so when we talk of malaria we have to start from these two pioneer workers lavran and sir ronald ross though we know that the mosquito fossils were found 30 million old fossils were found in africa and uh, we the fever associated with stagnant water it was basically referred to malaria 6 bc first historical evidence for quinine isolation was it came from 1820 from cinchona bark and then first time lavran the the scientist who discovered uh, seen the malaria parasite in red blood capsules in 1880 though in later 1892 sir patrick manson gave the mosquito malaria transmission theory very very important theory but then ultimately 1897 only sir ronald ross the right side the great man sir ronald ross he proved the transmission of malaria parasite through mosquitoes now after seeing the malaria parasite there was issue of controlling malaria and then it is started with ddt miracle chemical which was discovered and from 1939 later 42 its insecticidal properties were discovered and then the attack phase started venezuela was the first country which started malaria eradication program in 45 our indian scenario starts post uh, independent era but prior to that if you look on the global malaria risk problems you see the lower half of the hemisphere world hemisphere the entire area is red so these are all the affected area from the malaria now if a micro analysis was made you see the maximum these are all the gradations of the cases per thousand population and you see the darkest area is in africa these are above 250 cases per thousand population but you look on india this is somewhere here it is between 10 to 50 api but and these are all estimated cases some cases are very less now the issue came when we are trying to control or eliminate the disease and this was published in world malaria report uh, 19 now you see if this is the trajectory if you follow this trajectory uh, we were expecting somewhere this green color that our target for 2030 malaria elimination the trend should have been like this but unfortunately it is not what is actually being happened it is like this in between there is very faint line and even this line with the current trend we will not be able to achieve this 2030 target we have to do something where it has come that will what with that will be the justification for new innovations and the red color will be the worst scenario if we don't do anything we are going we are landing up in a very different situation now who has come out in global technical uh, strategy and uh, there is a concept of high burden to high impact uh, 10 plus 1 i mean 10 countries in africa and one uh, one india so there are four basic pillars where political will strategic information better guidance and coordinated approach these are the two four pillars it has to be combined together and that is what is actual integration in the system once these four pillars are inbuilt component as it is taken then the impact we are going to get now if you look on india scenario pre independence we were estimated that 75 million cases and deaths were 0.8 million 53 we launched the malaria control program and the indian indian scenario we have tested all control eradication and elimination era now 58 we were very successful so we we changed this whole thing to national malaria eradication program but because of complacency we we from 1965 we reversed back and 76 we tested a we it is very bitter taste was given and 6.46 million cases were recorded then immediately the policy was changed which was known as modified plan of operation 
so from control to eradication but ultimately what has happened in 97 again we had to reverse back the uh, eradication to again control project when world bank project support came now eradication was changed and then from 2016 we have we are targeted for malaria elimination aligning with global elimination program for malaria from 16 to 30 when we have done uh, policy making and strategy change in this indian context and four reference guidelines have been published for operational manual framework for malaria elimination integrated disease vector control and then strategic plan now actually what has happened after that malaria map is definitely shrinking in india you look on the 95 when we launched this malaria action plan then you look on 2015 which has been taken as a base for total malaria elimination program in india see the red color how slowly slowly it is narrowing down it is shrinking actually so the high risk area is vanishing now look on this graph because 61 malaria case detection system is started in india so all the data is available after 61 now 61 eradication 71 we started with urban malaria control scheme then 77 we launched modified plan of operation then 95 we have national anti malaria program then 2005 we started in intensified malaria control program and now we are in elimination phase now if we look on the categorization what we have done with malaria elimination the whole country has been divided into three strata 1 2 3 15 11 and 10 states are falling in those strata now these are the states which are falling in category 1 which is the lowest the category 2 pink color which is the moderate and the category 3 is the danger area which is the highest cases per thousand load malaria burden states now what are the strategy for these three strata though the general strategy is for parasite elimination disease management and uh, integrated vector management all the tools to use together and then supporting intervention like education and capacity building and human resource but a specific strategy for malaria elimination for different areas if you look for the high burden states all the strategy will be implemented in there with a choice with different uh, sub centers or primary health centers or blocks or sub district level but in the moderate zone it will be slightly reduced like two rounds of in intro residual spray anti larval urban area source reduction biological control allelion will be on the second priority in the second strata and the third strata which is the lowest one is the mainly social mobilization source reduction biological control and basically community empowerment because they have to sustain it and ultimately after this we want the whole india should be in a colorless like white color so that it is a zero category to achieve the elimination what innovations we require actually we have done like dr tyagi was telling that resistance problem is there so we have to develop some new molecule of insecticides there are there are certain things in pipeline like llirs are there there are something a uh, different llin with pbo they are also on the line uh, then vaccines dr tyagi has already discussed in detail uh, another newer molecules are coming for the insecticides in carbamate group and in nicotinoid but reducing breeding is very very hard work and regular surveillance which needs financial resources as well as a skilled human resource unless these two things are there which has already been affected during the covid because prioritization has changed not only for the national government but for the donor agencies also and then the third last one is coming as a genetic control which the different technologies are there which is under pilot one or two examples dr tyagi has already given about this uh, us uh, recent announcement but they are under pilot and we hope that something will come definitely here i will end my talk uh, and uh, i wish that uh, the next speaker will take up thank you thank you very much dr shivasava so i uh, will turn to our third speaker uh, this is dr luke alfi uh, he comes to us uh, from he's a group leader at the perbright institute in the united kingdom 
and is the ex-research director and co-founder of a company called Oxitec in UK, which has been uh, using uh, population suppression technologies that he will talk about. He will offer new solutions in a talk entitled, How Do We Overcome the Challenge of Vector-Borne Diseases? Luke, I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you. So I'm going to focus on uh, genetics-based methods as introduced uh, by the previous speaker, Dr. Uh, Shirostama. Uh, so the mainstay of control of mosquito-borne diseases has been uh, trying to manage the mosquito, partly by environmental mod modification, mostly with chemicals, and for malaria, some drug treatment, although that's not usually available for the virus diseases like dengue. So the idea, the concept of genetic pest management is what if we could spread a trait through relevant mosquito species that would do one of two different things, either reduce the ability of, of that mosquito species or population to reproduce, leading to a, a decrease in the number of vector mosquitoes, so that's population suppression, or alternatively, that would be maintained in the mosquito population, but reduce their ability to transmit dengue or malaria or whatever your particular disease of, of interest is. So then the mosquitoes would still be there, still filling their ecological niche, still biting people, but uh, unable or much less able to transmit the particular disease, and so affecting the disease rather than the, uh, the mosquito population particularly. That, if you like, is population suppression is largely what we try to do at the moment with chemicals and environmental modification and the like. Population replacement, as I just described it there, would be the equivalent of vaccinating the mosquito population if we could, which of course we can't for many reasons, but it would be the equivalent. The mosquitoes would still be there, but not transmitting. The idea of both is to reduce the vectorial capacity of the vector populations by genetic means, and so we call this genetic pest management. A difficulty is that although those genes or traits would be beneficial to humans, they are not generally beneficial to the mosquitoes, and so they would tend to be selected against and disappear from the target populations rather rapidly. And so in those large mosquito populations, to, to get the gene in and keep it there, we either need to release large numbers over a long period of time, or else use another genetic method, uh, which we generically call gene drives, to get the, to get the uh, modification to stay and spread. So here's an example of a genetic method, and this is the use of sterile males, so traditionally irradiated insects, not so effective for mosquitoes, but used in uh, some agricultural pests, or Wolbachia-based sterilization, or chemical-based sterilization, or, or sterilized by genetic modification. They're, they're operationally very similar. I'll describe the genetic modified one because it's what I know, what I've worked on mostly. So, uh, so this cartoon is mosquito reproductive biology, male meets females, sing little songs to each other, which for at least for Aedes aegypti they really do, and then uh, you end up with lots of little baby mosquitoes. So what if we were to release males, so these males in green, that have a genetic element in their genome, which leads to those offspring when they mate with wild female, so you release adult males, mate with the wild females, and they inherit a modification. And if that modification kills those, those developing uh, mosquitoes, then there will be fewer mosquitoes in the uh, wild population. And if you can get enough of the wild females to mate your sterile males, uh, over time the target population will decline and collapse. But the key and, and that can be very effective and, and has been with uh, this genetically modified uh, uh, system in multiple trials in different locations with 80 to 100 uh, percent suppression of the target population which models suggest would be enough to stop dengue transmission but the, the the general feature of this is this is how uh, genetic control works you're releasing some sort of modified mosquito to mate with wild mosquitoes and those mosquitoes that you that you release will only mate with uh, females of their own species and what's more they will fly out and look for them so they're both target seeking and extremely specific to the species that you're trying to control which from an environmental point of view is very attractive and also lets you find mosquitoes which humans find very hard to to uh, identify okay and then what happens when you release into a population so imagine these little blue circles are mosquito populations, somewhat separate, but, but connected by a degree of migration from one to another. So if you release a lot of your modified mosquitoes into one population, and you keep on doing that, of course, your mosquitoes will be present in that mosquito population because you're putting them there. But then what happens over time, or what happens when you stop? So first of all, you might imagine a self-limiting method, like sterile males. So if you 
if you stop producing sterile males, they will disappear from the environment pretty quickly. They live a matter of days or weeks, and then the whole uh, modification will disappear. And the population may rebound after that, but at least the modification will disappear. But on the other hand, you may have a, a genetic system that allows the, the genetics to maintain itself in the population even when you stop releasing. And that might be of a type that stays in the population where you put it, so it's not very invasive, but it stays persistent in that target population. Or you might have one that will spread through migration between the different populations. And, th and those are different features. And each of these things are, all three of these types of system are being developed. And so some examples of those on the left, I mentioned different types of self-limiting uh, systems, sterile males. These have mostly been used for Aedes aegypti. And if you look at the species range across here, it is mostly Aedes aegypti and uh, Anopheles. And, and the reason for that is those are the main vectors of the most important diseases. So dengue and yellow fever and chikungunya and Zika and so on for Aedes aegypti and uh, malaria for the Anopheles. But of course, Another feature of genetic control is it's extremely species specific. So uh, some situations, so Anopheles gambia, is, uh, or at least the gambia complex, is the major vector of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think India is in quite a relatively straightforward position in that Stephen's eye is the major vector in, in India. Some other parts of the world, you may have dozens of different vector species transmitting uh, malaria. And then it would be extremely difficult by such a species specific method to control transmission. And then for the Aedes, for dengue and chikungunya and these other diseases, Aedes aegypti and possibly secondarily Aedes albopictus are really the only important species. So in, in terms of uh, uh, transmission of public health. So if you can control those species specifically, that's very advantageous. Remember there are something like three and a half thousand named species of mosquito uh, in the world. Very, very few of them are significant vectors of, uh, of human disease and we want to target those. Okay, so self-limiting method like sterile males on the left, and then we can, and there are any number of gene drive designs, engineered ones like uh, underdominance based gene drives, uh, uh, naturally occurring one transplanted to new species like uh, uh, WML or Wabakia gene drive system, and also nowadays CRISPR Cas9 type gene drives building on previous ideas for other, other nucleases. And there, there are working examples of CRISPR Cas9 gene drives. Wabakia is the only one that's, that's in the field, and each of those sterile male systems have been successfully uh, field tested. So if we could do all of those things, at the moment we can't, but there are people actively developing each of them, which would you prefer? This is really a question for the audience rather than a question for the speakers, but um, they have different properties. So sterile males are extremely effective. They have a long history, particularly radiation, 50 year history of successful use on very large scales. But you need to release a lot of those sterile males pretty frequently, like every week or something like that. So they're very controllable, very reversible, very local, but relatively expensive to, to deliver. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, more invasive gene drives designed to spread through the entire uh, target species, you might need to release only very small numbers of them uh, scattered around the place for speed, but nonetheless, really quite small numbers and perhaps only once. And the, the genetics will then uh, do the work for you in terms of spreading the modification through the target uh, species. So that's very low cost deployment compared with sterile males. The actual development might be rather more expensive, but the, at least the deployment, which is usually the more expensive part, is relatively inexpensive. You lose quite a lot of the controllability and reversibility that you have with sterile males. And then local drives are somewhere in between. They're probably harder to make. To make something that will spread a bit, but not too much, is, is probably a little harder than either something that won't spread or that will spread indefinitely. And, and, and they are moderately controllable and reversible, and they're intermediate in a number of those, those ways. I think from a regulatory perspective, the uh, sterile males and local drives, things that target one population from a regulatory perspective, it's fairly clear you would regulate that. Something that would spread across international boundaries is a little bit more complicated. And there may be differences also if you're talking about an invasive species, like some Aedes aegypti populations, versus a species in its native environment, and so on. But in any case, the aim of developers is, is to is to give control program uh, managers and um, communities and politicians the choice of, of something. We have very, very few uh, control tools. As, uh, as the previous speakers indicated, at least with malaria, the numbers are coming down. We are winning, albeit much more slowly than we wish, 
or dengue and the other Aedes uh, born virus diseases, that's really not the case. We don't, malaria and dengue have been around a long time. We don't, um, you know, they, they tend, because they're persistent and, and endemic, they don't tend to get the same attention as an epidemic disease like SARS 2 COVID. But remember, mosquito borne disease, there are those type of mosquito borne diseases as well. Although chikungunya and Zika were identified in the middle of the 20th century, uh, very few people other than specialists knew about them until the early part of this century. So you know, outbreaks from 2004 of chikungunya and perhaps 10 years after that for, for, for Zika show that mosquito-borne diseases have very severe epidemic outbreak potential as well as the uh, endemic dengue and malaria. Okay, so, so many things, many systems are under development. Field trials of the engineered drives are on the horizon, but not closely on the horizon, I would say, but engineered uh, sterile males have been out there and uh, a wabaki based gene drive is also uh, out in the field. In relatively small field trials at the moment, each of these things have been, the trials that have occurred have generally gone extremely well. And, then, and just one other aspect of this, uh, Delphine in the next talk is gonna talk about community engagement, so I won't go into this in, in any detail at all, except to say, but firstly, there is a lot more to having a successful field uh, action than a technically effective product. So, what, so just making gene drive systems that work in the lab is by no means the whole story. But also one of the objections to even the development of genetically modified mosquitoes has been that, uh, will anybody ever want to use them? I just want to say, while skipping over the community engagement that led to this, just to point out that indeed, uh, engineered, genetic engineered mosquitoes uh, can be very well accepted, uh, very welcomed by populations. This is from a few trials in Brazil in an urban environment, it's a Brava, a village environment, Matacaru. And Brazilian scientists, this is after the program had been going for a little while, asked people in those, in those locations a number of questions. I've highlighted one. You want the project, uh, this is the release of genetically modified mosquitoes, to continue with releases in this community. 97 and 98 percent of the people said yes. So that doesn't mean that everybody everywhere is going to like them, but it certainly is possible to get very, very high approval of the use of genetic technology for disease control, in this case for Aedes aegypti and dengue in Brazil. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lou. So our final speaker in the panel is uh, Delphine Thiesi who is a stakeholder engagement and senior advisor for Target Malaria. She will emphasize empowering stakeholders to participate in disease management. Delphine, over to you. I've been asked to, to talk about what's the role of stakeholders and, and engagement in malaria control or in any disease management. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, is who are the stakeholders? And, and there often people think of communities um, as, as people living in an area where, where you have uh, a disease, malaria or dengue or, or other, others. But we've, we often fail to, to remember that there's, there are more stakeholders uh, than just uh, communities. Uh, you, you have uh, civil society, public health sector, private health sector and so on. And um, it, it's very important because when you start thinking of disease management, you need to recognize that all these stakeholders all have a different role in, in this process, but also have different motivations. Uh, why is a group going to be involved in disease management? So some people is, is their role by law, so that would be the case of Ministry of Health or, or organization as such, but other people have other motivation. It could be uh, from a disease perspective, uh, well-being, but it could be also economic motivations or other motivations. So all these need to be understood if you want uh, to, to start engaging and seeing what's the role of each uh, group. Uh, it's also very important to analyze the relationship between these stakeholders, to understand the influences, if there's any dependency. So it's, it's not uncommon, for instance, for communities um, to seek, let's say, advice or at least informal uh, opinion from other groups. They will look up to uh, other groups and in some cases those groups would be uh, academia and research, but in other cases they will look up for their religious or traditional authorities or civil society groups. And so 
this is very important because uh, we, we've been talking so far of science and science-based and all, all the other speakers have given us um, uh, citations for, for, their, for their arguments. But here you have to think that some of the actors uh, in, in this stakeholder map don't all um, follow just what is published. They will have other opinions. And this is very important to understand when you design uh, any engagement strategy. And finally, before you start, it's also very important to understand what's the knowledge of the disease. Um, I, I will give an example. So the project I work with uh, is trying to, to reduce the number of mosquitoes. And when we started uh, looking at, at stakeholders uh, in some countries in Africa where we work, we realized that people did not uh, make the make, always make the link between malaria and mosquitoes. Some people thought it was related to the water you'd be drinking or the type of food you'd be, you'd be eating. And so if, if you don't have that knowledge that mosquitoes are related, of course, it will impact how you perceive the intervention that's being proposed. So all this very important to understand when you start. Now there are different reasons to engage and, and um, it's kind of a spectrum. So, so project or, or, or country uh, policy makers, country uh, programs for disease might have different reasons. And um, there's no best, um, uh, it, it can be different. There's, there's different values behind them, but, but it's a whole spectrum. The first part, is very often stakeholders who live in an area where, where uh, vector-borne diseases are present actually have knowledge about those diseases. They, for instance, can be uh, very uh, knowledgeable in, in breeding sites, knowing where the mosquitoes were produced. Uh, we found, uh, for instance, in our project that uh, communities knew where the swarms were. They didn't know what the, the role of swarms were in, in mosquito reproduction, but when we asked them, they knew very well where they were. So there is a role uh, in them in identifying the disease drivers. The second part, which is often what people think when you think engagement, is acceptance. You want people to accept, to agree to an intervention. And if you don't have that uh, acceptance, uh, usually it, it's kind of the end of the intervention. You can't implement or you're going to go into a, a real conflict with the community uh, and so that, that won't, um, won't make the intervention possible. And this acceptance relies on trust and understanding as well as the agreement on the common goal. People need to agree that this is eradication is a good idea, that the way it's going to be done is a good idea and so all that comes back to what I said earlier about motivations uh, of stakeholders. The third part, we, which is not always um, considered, is that uh, stakeholders can actually support the design of the intervention. So they can propose improvements or they can be part of risk assessment. So they can say what is their concern so that when uh, developers and regulators look at a new intervention, they can take into account these concerns, which then um, uh, feeds into this acceptance question and builds trust that um, developers and regulators are listening. And then finally, what everyone dreams for is engagement for empowerment. So then you get stakeholders who will own the intervention, which will increase sustainability and durability. And the recent months with COVID have, have showed how important that is. So WHO has estimated that we could go back 15 years uh, of progress um, in, in malaria elimination because simply um, health workers are not able these days to access, uh, to, to come and deliver the intervention. And because you rely on, on people from outside of the community very often to deliver an intervention, once this is impossible, in this case COVID, but you could think of conflict or other reason why one cannot access, then the, the, the intervention is not sustained and then all the progress uh, are, are uh, eliminated, which is uh, very serious. Now we have a lot of example about what happened when, when engagement is insufficient. And, and here you have different ones I wanted to show. So you have, um, people would have heard, I'm sure, uh, the, the issue with the anti-vaccination movement. And it's, it's global and it's one of the reasons why polio hasn't been uh, eradicated. Uh, the world was very close to eradicate polio, but fears of vaccination have reduced the ability uh, to reach the, 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 last, uh, the last groups 
and therefore uh, we are not getting there. And this is um, uh, this particular example is, is a very clear example where just throwing more science and more facts doesn't work. Uh, there is an emotional uh, a dimension of the anti-vaccination movement about what are the drivers, why people are concerned, and just showing them more uh, safety data and efficacy data hasn't proven uh, uh, sufficient. Um, we've seen it with COVID, uh, and, and uh, this I, I, I like this title, showing that fake news about COVID can be as dangerous as the virus because people, uh, you, you could have tension between people because they would think a particular group are bringing the disease to, to their communities or because they will then lead to, um, to uh, uh, taking measures that are actually more dangerous. Uh, and we have heard uh, famous people in this world uh, calling for measures that would actually be harmful for people. So it's very uh, important to recognize this. And again, it's back to this question of who people trust and what are the source of information they would trust. Um, in, in, a, in another example, in the Ebola outbreak, uh, it, it, the question was different. It wasn't so much about not trusting the facts, but it was a question of how health workers were perceived. And people, uh, so um, hospital where uh, Ebola infected people would enter and then they would see them exiting it uh, dead. So they so something was happening in this hospital. And again, the, the, the rumor and how this was managed was very complicated and, and it did slower uh, the, the Ebola response. So how, uh, how could we do a community participation? How do you ask people to participate? So the first part, which is more and more understood is the fact that engagement is not something you do once. You don't come with an intervention and then you ask people, do you want it? And it's a yes, no question. You have to start really early. And in, for instance, in the development of, of new tools such as uh, genetic engineering, like Luke described, you need to start really early and often people start even before you have a technology because you want people to feel they are part of this, they're part of this design and this testing. Uh, and it needs to be uh, continuous um, throughout the project. The second part is you need to give meaningful information and, and the important word in this is meaningful. What is meaningful? So you have to uh, first make sure people, as I say, understand their knowledge level so you can build on it, but also uh, make sure, uh, for instance, that you speak in, in the local language, if it's a different language from, from the main language of the country, but also that the information um, corresponds to what people are interested. So in our project, we found if you, if you we work in, in uh, rural country, rural villages in, in Africa, People, uh, when we talk about gene editing, they want to understand what's a gene in general terms. They want to understand that you're changing it and what it will do. But they are not really interested in all the molecular parts. Uh, they, they're interested in the, the impact of that, what's the risk, the benefit. So this is meaningful. If you start throwing at them all the complexity of molecular biology, it, it's not considered meaningful because people uh, might not be able to absorb However, complexity cannot be an excuse not to share information. You can't just say, oh, we won't tell people anything. You will just tell them it's a great intervention and they should love it. So it's, just, it's a difficult balance to strike in between. The third principle is, is to engage as a dialogue. So people can express their concerns, their expectations and get answers, not just a one side. It, it's a real dialogue and it, it builds over time. And finally, to be really meaningful, the, the participation um, has to show that it's considering the inputs. So if communities are proposing something for the design or, or if they're expressing risk, they need to feel that this is taken into account and it's not just a nice exercise where they just talk but no one uh, really does anything with their inputs. Um, and then the, the, the last part we wanted to discuss was uh, the role of, of uh, communities and the role of education and, and surveillance. And there are very interesting um, examples uh, and it's growing about what we call citizen science. And I think um, having, been, having lived a bit in India, that India has always been very uh, at the forefront of innovation 
uh, for, for a lot of things and how you, how you can use technologies uh, to involve the population. And I think this is a really interesting example. Uh, there are a lot of, of projects that are looking at um, engaging citizens on how you could track mosquitoes. Uh, and it's particularly done for invasive species, so Aedes mosquitoes, and trying to see how you get people uh, involved in identifying mosquitoes and using uh, apps, making people feel they are part of it. They're not just receiving an intervention. And this plays a role in education because people feel like they're learning about mosquitoes, but they're also acting. And in, in these days of social media, and, and, and people wanting to take back uh, power and control, it's very important that they feel they're not just um, recipients of, of engagement. And so my summary is uh, you have very diverse stakeholders. They have different interests and motivation to participate that need to be recognized. There's a big spectrum of reason to engage, uh, but in, in all cases, you need to do that early uh, because it will gain you time in the long term including for uh, uh, adoption of new disease uh, control. It's not a one size fits all activities, uh, but there are key principles to make it meaningful. So you need to adapt to your context and it can be very specific. It can vary even within the country and even more such a large country as India. And finally, citizen science is a, is a new way to approach the role of community and, and the role of communities in their own health. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, Delphine. So I'm going to now turn this into the panel discussion. And uh, Delphine, I want to start with you because the series is entitled Science Serving Society. And you talked a little bit about who in society uh, needs to have a say in this. So I want to, you to talk about some of the challenges you face in, in engaging stakeholders. And among the questions that are coming from the audience, I see concerns. How do you address concerns that stakeholders have, whether it's about ecological impact or other kinds of impact? Uh, um, how have you addressed this in, in your uh, uh, experience? So I think um, it, what's been interesting is to see, um, one thing I always say, for example, about ecological uh, concerns, which I find very interesting as a social scientist, is it's a, it's a concern that's shared. So whether I engage a um, um, UN ambassador of a country or a, a top level government officer or a villager who has no education, they will have the same concern, uh, which is reassuring because it means that globally, we, we do have the same lens when we look at these kind of things. Now, um, there's a real power in, in saying what you know and what you don't know. And I think the COVID, uh, again, has told us that. The importance of, of telling people, okay, this is what we know, for example, about the role of mosquito in ecology uh, and, and the diversity uh, of it as well, depending species, and what we don't know yet, and, what, and how you're going to get to an answer. And acknowledging this gap of knowledge and, and showing the the path the pathway to get to an answer and i think in our experience that's been very uh, helpful the other part which is probably mostly the challenge in this is the um, again the diversity of stakeholder and diversity of motivation so i think for me the biggest challenge has been how you deal with uh, a dialogue that is very very much global because this is the world we live in these days and of course, your perception and your motivation will vary depending on how much you're exposed to the disease. So we do hear a lot from people who um, will probably never get malaria because they don't live in areas where malaria is present. They might not even go. And if they go, they'll take prophylaxis, which proves to be quite efficient if you go for a short period of time. And so their perception of the risk and benefit of trying new technology is very different than what you would have in a village where uh, in the case of malaria, is a very clear death sentence in, in a lot of cases. And people, all, all the families we meet, all had uh, people who died around them from this disease. So this is a real complexity because you don't want to, uh, you don't want to say that the concerns of people living, in, let's say, North America, are not important. But how you tell them your concern is important, but so is the concern of the people directly affected. Oh, it Thank was a you. long answer to a short question. 
No, no, that's it. Thank you very much. Dr. Srivastava, I want to go back to uh, a point you touched upon, <clears throat> that in 1965, <clears throat> India came very close to eliminating malaria with <clears throat> only 100,000 cases and <clears throat> hardly any deaths. And now, 45 years later, we have 6.7 million cases, uh, um, and we are trying to eliminate malaria uh, uh, by 2030. So what are the lessons learned from how close we came to the finish line and that last mile completion? Uh, and is that relevant to today's context? Uh, thank you. The question which, which compiles all the questions, I believe. We have learned a lot of lessons during eradication phase and the 6.4 million cases which we got in 76. Now we are close to roughly on the same trend reported cases, something around 1 million cases, little less than that. Uh, earlier, we from 2013-14, we started with 2 million plus now we have come to 1 million reported cases. But there are estimates and estimates are roughly uh, tricky because different estimates, they give different uh, scenario in the malaria situation in the country. See, the, the, the finish line is for elimination is the different criteria. For eradication is entirely a different criteria. That is why from control, we were very optimistic and we went to eradication phase that we will radically remove the disease, which was not possible. So now the whole global concern is on elimination. Elimination has that we will have zero indigenous cases in the area. Now, as you fully are, are I mean, everybody knows that India is a basically a, a congregation of multiple countries. What we see in other countries, smaller countries, uh, will be a uh, intermingling of all those things. In India, we have got nine recognized vector species, plus with the support of research organizations, two more have already been given on the reports. So, like uh, Luke was telling that uh, Stephensa, Stephensa is a vector for urban malaria. The strategy is entirely different. So the outcome will be different with the same strategy. So the strategy has to be changed. And we have already listed different kinds of strategy in different kinds of scenario. And we are very hopeful with the trend going on with the reported cases. Unless there are some factors which are mitigated properly, like for example, change, behavioral change communication is very, very important. What we are service providers are giving that must be appreciated with the faith and received by the beneficiaries. Unless the proper treatment for full course of treatment is done, unless the proper insecticidal spray is done, and that has now very badly affected during COVID. Because in malaria program, what is happening that we have to go to the community. It is not that simple that we have to attack on vector side, we have to attack on the parasite side, both. Plus for that social mobilization, very, very important. Now everybody is alert for COVID. So everybody wants to be at home safe. So this is, this is what is affecting, but we are very hopeful because 2030 is uh, uh, not very near. It is still 10 years and uh, we have planned 27 and then three years we have kept for sustaining the, our achievement. So we have a gasping period of three more years from 27 to 30. Let us hope for the best. What we were talking about the World Bank, uh, sorry, World Malaria Report, that was a trend of estimate. If this does not happen, we are going to land up in situation B. And if situation B, we are not coping, we will be in the reverse trend on situation C. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Luke, I want to go uh, <clears throat> to uh, something you said about the use of the technologies that you mentioned. Uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more on where the different technologies have been used with some examples and also talk a little bit about the importance of modeling uh, how these uh, different technologies would behave in the real field trials. All right, thank you. Um, for mosquitoes, these, well, these methods are fairly new. And so there's not an enormous amount of field experience yet. So to skip the second part of the question, we want to know what is likely to happen 
and everybody does, politicians and regulators and indeed the scientists involved, what's going to happen before we have actual data, then modeling is absolutely crucial. Modeling will let us examine uh, not only what we think will happen, but in what way that is sensitive to a whole range of parameters. So from a developer's point of view, what would the performance of Mosquito have to be to be useful and also to test out various strategies. So I think every one of these strategies has been uh, probably modeled more extensively than we have when we have actual field uh, data by, by quite a way. So modeling has been crucial. Uh, in terms of field experience, by far the majority is with radiation-based sterile males, so irradiated sterile males in the context of agricultural pests. They've been used on small scales for little disclosed eradication projects like one in New Zealand um, against a moth, but also on huge scales, so continental scale elimination of the New World screw worm from North America and Central America in a rolling program of release of radiation sterilized males. Uh, and all of this is about 1950, so we have more than 50 years of experience of how to use sterile males. That's mostly with radiation. Uh, there was there, there some work with uh, mosquitoes sterilized with chemosterilins, uh, for which residues were thought to be rather toxic, but that's been revisited a little more recently. In terms of genetic engineering, uh, sterile male mosquitoes was from about 2009, so a little more than 10 years experience. And that's been, that was first in the Cayman Islands and later most of the, most of the uh, action was in, and still is in Brazil. And um, well, back here is confusing because it has more than one use. So one is that you can use more back here infected males are sterile with uninfected males. And so you can use those in a sterile male type method, uh, sometimes called incompatible insect technique. And that has been used in a number of countries, including the US on, on fairly small scales, but again, with, with very good data. So with that method, you tend to get very high quality males that do rather well. The issue is that you can't afford to release any females because those are not sterile with those, with those males. And um, the, radiate, the genetically modified males have also been extremely effective in the trials where they've been used. This is overwhelmingly for AD to Gypsy. Uh, the only, no engineer gene drives have gone to the field yet. Uh, the leading ones are probably hardly malaria's ones that uh, Delphine is associated with, but not the, they're not, not the only ones developed by, by a long way. Um, and that's targeting Anopheles gambii. They have used a different version of their technology in field trials, which is, which is another sterile male um, technology. And then, so the only gene drive that's gone out in, into the field is uh, Wabakia based one, so a different use of the Wabakia technology has it established and spread in the target population aiming because the infected uh, mosquitoes are less able to transmit uh, dengue. And that was first trial in Australia because it's an Australian project that developed it and then in Vietnam and again also in Brazil and one or two other places. Again on rather, on rather small scales but again quite successfully where the, where the modification has established and spread in the sort of gene drive way that you would hope and expect it to, to do. So although it's early days, each of these technologies has basically been pretty successful in the limited field trials we've had so far. Thank you so much, Luke. What are the other challenges with respect to the use of insecticides? And is this a sustainable strategy? What are the things that need to be done to keep insecticides at the forefront and have them be uh, an important part of the strategy for malaria elimination? See, insecticide resistance, the basic reason for insecticide resistance is plenty of insecticide used with sublethal doses and mosquitoes have been exposed. So insecticide pressure is very, very crucial while we have been using insecticide, which has been the main control state. Now, to tackle the insecticide resistance, even WHO has given global resistance, insecticide resistance monitoring is very, very important. GPRIM. Global Program for Resistance Monitoring, they have, they have documented. It's a very nice book. Now, what is happening that insecticide resistance is to be monitored regularly for which particular class of insecticide or which particular insecticide the resistance is established in that particular area. But in our country, what we have taken, we have seen that certain amount of insecticide resistance 
may not show the epidemiological impact. So once it is coupled, it is together, we are not seeing epidemiological <laughs> impact and we are recording insecticide resistance, then we go for alternative insecticide or another insecticide, either of the same group like synthetic pyrethroid or another class of insecticide. And there are new molecules which are coming up. Like for example, I am telling you one insecticide which has got with a six months uh, residual toxicity, long lasting insecticidal uh, uh, residual analysis that is coming up and that is under trial. So there are alternatives which are being used. Plus the biggest support has come with long lasting insecticidal nets. So LLIN has been very, very crucial. And there are also a lot of innovations and technological things are being done. So let me begin by thanking the 221 people who are signed on to the webinar. This uh, exceeds our expectations and is certainly more than we could fit into a seminar room uh, anywhere. Uh, so, and I also want to thank the panelists for a very short but uh, precise description of their areas of expertise. And uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, we focused on uh, uh, the problems, uh, the, uh, the challenge posed by mosquito-borne diseases we focused on the current uh, st uh, status, uh, that is where, where we are and progress being made and so on, as well as offering new solutions. So we did in fact uh, uh, follow the theme that we set for ourselves. This was the first of a series of experiments I hope will, will uh, turn into a larger conversation. Uh, I see lots of wonderful questions from the audience in the chat uh, room and so we'll try and find a way to answer those. But I really want to thank all of you for making this a success. I want to thank you for your support and particularly the, to the panelists who have, uh, you know, really from all over the world, uh, taken the time to uh, participate with us. Thanks again and have a great day.